Welcome everyone, welcome to the 2023 AGM and the fourth we've hosted digitally. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. We keep our fingers crossed for broadband. We hope that all those years of training with the dogs means that they're going to stay quiet. Don't worry, it'll be a breeze. So we're having an online AGM again and that enables us to do more things with our funds and it will allow us to be more sustainable and hopefully a little bit more accessible. But we know that nothing beats uh, an in-person event. And I know a lot of you have inquired about when face-to-face -face AGMs will return. And I can announce that we do intend to have a face-to-face -face AGM next year. Um, and that will be fantastic because I know not just you as members, but us as staff have uh, missed that interaction as well. So we'll have the evening fundraiser, hopefully the celebrity speaker. Um, and the date is likely to be a little bit earlier next year, hopefully late June, maybe early July, just because our accounts will be coming forward. So it will be a summer AGM. So fingers crossed for the weather in the summer. Keep your eyes open for a uh, save the date communication coming out either in the magazine or maybe through email as well. So that's an exciting thing to look forward to next year. However, for now, we're able to speak to you in the comfort of your own homes uh, and hopefully we will uh, have a great day and I'm quite sure we will. And we're extremely grateful for your continued support. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a run through in terms of proceedings. I will shortly be handing over to our president, Professor Jules Pretty, who will be chairing the meeting. Many of you will know Jules. Uh, some of you may be new to the trust and this may be your first AGM. So Jules is a well-known broadcaster, author, professor of environment and society at the University of Essex. And we're very pleased and hugely proud to have him as our president. Now, Jules has been inspiring us with research and writing for many years, and he'll be kicking off shortly with a talk. Uh, and then he'll guide us through proceedings, the formal business of the 64th Annual General Meeting. After Jules's introductory talk, we'll have the Director of Conservation, Dr. Jeremy Dagley, and he'll be delivering his second State of Nature in Essex talk. This is our annual summary of the big wildlife trends in the county based on research on our own reserves. Jules will then take us through the business agenda, and this will include me answering some of your many questions that you've uh, posed um, and if we don't get a chance to answer all of those questions, if some questions, if we get a lot of questions in the chat or if we get a lot of questions that come in after this event, don't worry. All of the questions will be uploaded to the AGM webpage for you to read through at your leisure. There will be no question that will remain unanswered. After the Q&A session, we'll have some fantastic awards to announce and then that will be us done. So I'm now going to hand over to Professor Jules Pretty to kick things off. So Jules, it's over to you. Thanks very much, Andrew, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the show today. Uh, pleasure to be hosting the 64th um, AGM. As Andrew said, we'll be back in person next year, um, uh, and let's hope for a, a day like today. Um, I'm going to start with a little introduction to some remarks on nature recovery, um, and then move us um, after a few words from Andrew again on the uh, from Jeremy and then Andrew again into the formal process of the meeting. So um, nature recovery. Uh, for more than 60 years, the Wildlife Trust has been a powerful agent of nature recovery. Reserves, habitats, species, people. But nationally and internationally, things not looking so good. 
um, planetary boundaries. Six of the nine that have been identified by Johan Rockstrom and his colleagues have been breached this year. For us, we can point to all sorts of things. 800 deliberate releases of sewage into our rivers and seas per day last year. Um, uh, all sorts of challenges that are still ahead of us. But something else is happening that I wanted to begin. My first of three words beginning with A, um, and this is about abundance. Uh, subtle shifts are happening over a syndrome called shifting baselines. We may have forgotten just how dense and abundant nature once was. And I just picked a couple of books and I just want to read a very short um, uh, quote from D.W. Gillingham's book, Unto the Fields, um, written in the mid 50s, uh, published in the mid 50s, but about him walking around the Roding Valley in southwest Essex in the 1930s. And he wrote, what a carnival of life, plowland flickered with birds, the hedges too, an immense flock of chiff chaffs and yellow hammers, migrant larks and crows and stock doves and chick chacking field fares and lapwings. This was in a walk at this time of year in October in, in about 1932. Um, in a woodland glade in winter, he heard loud rustling sound. He thought it was deer and saw it was a great host of tits, great tits, blue tits, cold tits and black cap marsh tits. Some skipped overhead, others adorned, um, uh, advanced over the leaves on the ground. The flock passed by, the tinkling and rustling faded and the glade again was silent. And he writes of this extraordinary abundance, which we've kind of perhaps forgotten about, and it's something that we should be aiming for. Uh, number two, Samuel Ben Susan, S.L. Ben Susan, um, wrote about the Essex marshlands, and this is a book called The Marshland Omnibus, and the life on the Denji. And he was called by the Guardian, the Laureate of the Marshes, wrote in the 40s and 50s in particular, nationally. And of course, wrote about the red squirrels, and wrote specifically of one place that he called the Vale of Nightingales because of the huge numbers of nightingales on the Denji Peninsula. Um, he also mentioned a local woman who said, I can't abide them nightingales. They make too much noise. I shoo them away, she said. So I suppose kind of attitudes to the noise from nature may be changing over time. So the first thing I want to draw our attention to is abundance and to kind of think about the imagination that's required for us to be shooting, not just a return to how things were 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but before a lot of the damage that we've seen uh, internationally as well as locally. There's a Japanese saying that goes, it's not us who will save the creatures and nature, but the creatures who will save us. And there's powerful evidence that if you live within 500 meters of green space in cities, you live two to three years longer. If you volunteer, particularly for conservation um, type of activities outdoors and in nature, you live two years longer. That daily nature contributes to happy longevity. A daily dose of nature, kind of language that we've used in some publications from the university, a daily dose of nature increases well-being. Secondly, I want to draw attention to attentiveness, that engagement with nature um, uh, when we do that and it's, and we're very attentive to what's happening around us, interesting things happen. We notice interesting things. A couple of examples. The author Gary Murchie was an aviator and writer in the 1950s. And he wrote of one example um, of being on an airbase in California, Travis Air Base, and they were engine testing with these great um, jet engines um, on the tarmac. And he wrote about how gulls would drop into the air blast from the jet engines and whoosh about 400 meters downstream and then fly back again, wide eyed, you can imagine. Maybe that's a bit anthropomorphic and coming around again and having another go at this kind of dropping into the blast um, to be any animal behaviors and bird behaviors may lie outside sometimes of our our kind of descriptions and our imagination and our certainly our understanding. Um, I've worked quite a lot in Northern Iceland in uh, where communities have shifted from whale 
hunting to whale watching in recent years. And Husavik is a tiny Arctic village um, that used to be whale hunting and is now uh, whale watching. And they attract 100,000 visitors a year. And what we've seen is the regeneration of the village, restaurants, hotels, cafes, museum, village hall, the church um, regenerated. Um, at the beginning of the process, none of the fishers could have the imagination that people would want to come and look at the whales, or even pay for it, because they had formerly hunted them. So there was a kind of psychological shift that was needed in this kind of imagination. Um, and since that hunting has stopped, uh, over a kind of 25 to 30 year period, the whales now swim up to the boats in the Bay of Hustavik. Um, Five species, abundant in numbers, and you can you almost feel as though the whales are welcoming in the people because they feel in some way safe. Certainly, you can guarantee to see them at any time of the year. So attentiveness to nature is my second day. Um, my third one is about action. Um, I'm chair of the Essex Climate Action Commission, uh, and it's been it, it, this is engaged in a whole range of activities to try to address the climate crisis. Andrew is uh, one of the commissioners on the commission. Um, it is clear that 80% of people in the region, this is according to surveys, are in favour of more action to address the climate and nature crises. You could look at the news, uh, I'd read the papers and think something different. You could also look at the extreme weather events and nature loss and conclude we're not moving fast enough. Uh, I mean, we've just seen the news that September was the hottest September in the world ever. Uh, and, and although we say today is a lovely day, which it is, it's also kind of not lovely because it's October and it feels like June in the middle of the day. Um, so progress looks like this, 149 countries in the world with tough net zero targets. That's 90% of the world's GDP. 8,000 cities, regions, investors, large businesses. The World Economic Forum used to be the bastion of old bad growth, if I can put it that way. The growth that harms nature, economic growth that harms nature, and is now promoting green growth um, and saying that if countries support green growth, they estimate that $10 trillion worth of growth will be created across the world by 2030, 400 million new jobs. But if countries and governments don't support that agenda, they'll miss out on this great opportunity. The Climate Change Commission in the UK, committee, committee um, in this year, in its, in its um, report, uh, the last report of Lord Deben, um, as chair, uh, noted that green investments create jobs, reduce emissions and reduce household costs. So we can look at these kind of win-wins of the economy and nature and addressing climate. So there's a simple message, invest in our natural capital and costs come down for people and for countries. So that's my third A, action, which you could also call agency, because that's about us being feeling able to act it's worth acting because there's a good outcome to it. So I conclude my remarks with three A's, abundance, attentiveness, and agency. And I often say to young people when I give talks, it's not your job to save the planet, but it is to have hope. And it is um, to act in ways that will help um, save us all. We shouldn't put too much burden on individuals to be saving the planet. But if we address abundance and attentiveness and agency, I think we can do an awful lot locally. Um, and, um, and I'm delighted that the Wildlife Trust is playing such a leading role in all of that. That's my talk for this morning. Now I switch back into chairing mode and say thank you uh, for that introductory remarks, um, <laughs> uh, oddly. And I switch uh, directly to Jeremy Dagley. So Jeremy is a, um, our Director of Conservation. Um, and Jeremy, you're going to give us the update on the state of nature um, in Essex, uh, 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 as you pioneered last year. Um, and um, I'll come back after Andrew has um, closed off some remarks to begin the AGM. So, uh, Jeremy, over to you. Thank you very much, Jules. If uh, they could load the first slide, please. 
And uh, next slide, thank you. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to follow on from Jules uh, uh, with uh, starting with the sort of gloomy end of things, I suppose, with the recent State of Nature report, which is the fourth report in 10 years, and which unfortunately um, continues the theme of uh, biodiversity crisis uh, deepening, uh, with over half our plant species having declined in their, both their distribution and abundance over the last 50 years, and a quarter of those plant species being threatened. It's a situation even worse for birds with 43% um, of our birds in a threatened status. Um, and the interesting thing on that is that overall, we've got one in six species in Britain and one in seven in England uh, at uh, in threatened status. And if you want to know what threatened status means, it's a, a internationally recognized series of criteria. And you can see them on the right hand side of the screen there, vulnerable, endangered and critically endangered. And those threatened statuses are, as I say, recognized across the board. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those as I uh, feature some species that we've been monitoring. But of course, there is also hope in this report. Um, and that's what Essex Wildlife Trust is all about, about bringing hope and reversing those declines. Next slide, please. And we do this um, through a number of ways. But one of the key things, of course, is to have a monitoring program, which I spoke about at the last AGM. And what is really delighted to say, having uh, only set up the conservation evidence team in, in the last year and the monitoring programme itself only been going for just over two years, we've now got 74% coverage of the trust reserves with at least one of our 12 modules having been carried out across the reserves. And what you can see on the map there is, is the coverage, which as you can see, goes right across the whole of Essex, across all our reserves. Um, so 74% coverage, but also a very broad uh, county-wide coverage. And you can see from the little um, disks on each reserve that there are a multitude of modules being, being surveyed. And I'm going to have a look at a few of those in a moment. So the impact is, is high on our monetary program. And that's essential to know what's going on. Next slide, please. One of the key ones are birds because they're sort of top of the food chain for many things. Um, they're well and easily studied and uh, they've produced reliable data over many, many years. We've been doing uh, uh, annual, breed birding, annual bird breeding surveys now for uh, three years, and we've been doing it across uh, 51 of our 93 reserves. So over half of our reserves have bird data. As you remember from the first slide, 43% of birds in Britain are in threatened status. That is, there's a high likelihood of extinction in the country if we're not careful. But what you can see that is so-called red list status, that high threatened status. You can see from the diagram there, which don't look at the detail, but that um, 46 of our 51 reserves have a red listed birds breeding on them. And all of our uh, 51 reserves that we're studying have amber listed, a status just below the red list status. So you can see the importance of the reserves as refuges. I'm just gonna look at one of those bird species, the turtle bird, which is a critically endangered species. Next slide, please. Now, turtle doves are declining very, very rapidly. And in the last 50 years in my lifetime, they've declined by 93%. But Essex remains a stronghold, particularly along the coast. And the most important sites in Essex are the Essex Wildlife Trust Reserves. And you can see four of them illustrated on this, on this map. And you can see the years 2021 to 2023, the three years that we've been doing the annual bird breeding census, uh, illustrated there in different colors with orange for this year. And as you can see, it's a mixed picture with Abbott's Hall in the middle there actually having no birds this year for the first time in living memory. So uh, it's a real shocker if you like. However, what you'll see that Rabness, which is the best site in the county, is stable at the moment, and that Fingering Ho, the species, has bounced back. So it's a very important illustration of how important monitoring itself is to get that trend also showing that the bird is adaptable. It's moved into Sergeant's Orchards, for example, a new site there on the right. And we're working very closely with the RSBB specialist team across the county, not just in our own reserves, but of course with private landowners across the wider landscape. Next slide, please. And it's about that um, ability to intervene and to manage land, which is very important based on conservation evidence. And here you see um, a, pr a project at Bif uh, the Blue House Farm funded by Biffa to the tune of a third of a million. Very important project, spend a lot of money on it, but it's based on robust scientific evidence. And what you'll see is the impact that that's had straight away in a matter of a year. You've got there illustrated the 2022 figures and the 2023 figures in orange. 
for the lapwing and the red shank, birds that are in real decline and under real threat. And that impact you can see there, the lapwing numbers are up by 60%, red shank numbers are up by 35%. And you might say, well, yeah, well, 2023 was just a very good year, wasn't it? How do you know it was the impact of the project? Next slide, please. And what this shows for the red shank, just one of those two species, is that there was a really significant impact with the work that we did, re-wetting 40 hectares of the grassland and putting a, a predator exclusion fence around those re-wetted areas. You can see from the left-hand side there where I've outlined it in red, that the, you could, the birds have increased massively on round marsh where the, there is predator exclusion fencing and re-wetting. Now you could see they've moved from over the railway, which is on the left-hand side, where they've, they've just, just moved. But we know that they have increased by 35%. And you can see that in the second red blob there, which I've circled, which shows the flat fields, four of them, which we've re-wetted and put fencing around. The numbers have increased from nothing to the numbers there, uh, nearly nine, nine pairs. Next slide, please. And talking of impact and talking of monitoring, um, I think the insects illustrate it very well. We know we've got a, not just a biodiversity crisis, but we've some people have called it the insect apocalypse, which is uh, dramatic. Um, here you can see that uh, on Abbott's Hall Reserve, just a single reserve, we're bucking the national trend. If you look at the top of the slide next to the photograph of the lovely gatekeeper butterfly, which is a common species of scrub and grassland, that the UK trend is for a 42% loss, decline in numbers, in the 44 years since 1976, and the 10-year average decline is 11%. And what you see here on the diagram is a 10-year study that we've done. It's longer than the general program. We've been doing the butterfly uh, monitoring for more than a decade now. You can see for a te our 10-year average, rather than a decline of 11%, we've doubled the numbers. Next slide, please. And what you can then see, I think, for a similar species, another grassland species, but even a more specialist grassland species, the lovely small heath, which in my lifetime, I, I got used to it being a common species of dry grassland. You can see here that those top figures show that the UK trend is half the species, 49%, half the numbers have gone in 44 years, with again, a 10 year average of decline of 13%. And that's meant that, as you can see on the left-hand side, the small heath in red there is NT, is near threatened. It's but a common butterfly has actually become near threatened. It looks gloomy, but it shows when you look at the data from our reserve, five reserves shown there on that graph, that although the numbers go up and down a bit, the overall increase in blue with the red line running through it is an overall increase since 2011. Over the last decade, they've increased on our five reserves where we're monitoring them. However, what you can also see is a mixed picture compared to the gatekeeper in that last year with that very, very dry summer, what uh, Jules has referred to, um, it's even hotter and drier if you remember last summer, very dry parched grassland. This grassland butterfly didn't do well in its second generation, which it needs at the end of the year, at this time of year, September time, October time, and it fell in numbers. The good news is that we know that the numbers have bounced back this year in 2023, but I just can't yet show them on this slide. Well, it shows, I think these insects are the importance of our reserves and the importance of long-term monitoring. Next slide, please. The final one on insects and the, the penultimate slide just on uh, pollinators, something that the, nature, uh, the uh, study showed, that the State of Nature report nationally showed was that pollinators have decreased by 22%. That's an astonishing amount for a, a, a group of insects that are absolutely crucial to our food production. Interestingly, we have a group of insects, a section 41 species, they're so-called called, they're protected uh, as conservation priority species under the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act, and they're bumblebees. Essex is really important for bumblebees, and it illustrates here the brown banded carva. What's great is that this has actually expanded its range. It's moved northwards in Essex, possibly in response to climate change, and now breeds at Abbott's Hall, having only previously resided in the, the Thames side. That's really great news. To modify that, though, we know that the shrill cardiby, a close cousin, did also expand, but seems to be retracting. And we need to understand why. The importance of research, which we hopefully will be carrying out with uh, uh, the Environment Agency and with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, is illustrated here. We do need to understand why those numbers are not always going in the same direction for different species. Next slide and final slide. I just want to end with a, a really nice piece of news about wildflowers. Green-winged orchids using the uh, red list criteria are vulnerable to extinction in England. That's again pretty astonishing. And I remember when I started in conservation, we had 
uh, green maned orchid meadows on Mersey Island. They were destroyed shortly after I started conservation um, through a loophole in the uh, Wildlife and Countryside Act at the time. But what's extraordinary, as you can see from the figures there on the slide, is that uh, Essex Wildlife Trust has four reserves with really high numbers of this wonderfully, uh, wonderful, beautiful species on it, this vulnerable species. And what's more striking is that Oxley Meadow has nearly 50,000. What we know is that that number is actually slightly declining, so we've got to be careful to monitor that and the importance of monitoring emphasised again. But what we also know from speaking with uh, Kew Gardens research team is that Oxley Meadows is possibly the most important uh, site or the best suited site in terms of its soil and its mycorrhizal fungi, the fungi that associate with the roots of orchids, in the whole of England. So interestingly, Oxley Meadow isn't statutorily protected. It has no SSSI protection. It's not even a local nature reserve. The only reason it's there is because of Essex Wildlife Trust. We've protected the site. We've also managed it. This, this flower needs constant management. It needs hay mowing and it needs grazing. So only because of our protection do we have that 50,000 display of orchids. And the monitoring, of course, is vital because we need to know where that number is going up or down. But we're hoping to continue that research with Kew Gardens. And uh, I hope to finish on that rather lovely note that we do support an amazing population, this wonderful plant, despite the fact it's vulnerable across England. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, and that's a, a really wonderful storytelling. And I hope everyone feels quite sort of inspired by that. I think it really demonstrates just how important it is to monitor. We want to be an evidence led organisation. It's so fundamental. If we're going to make good strategic decisions, we need to know what's going on on our land and with our species. Um, and equally, we want to be able to tell our members and tell our funders and tell all of our supporters that we are having an impact. We are making a difference. So that was really wonderful. To hear. And I think 74% coverage of our reserves in year two is, is really great for, for a, a relatively new team. So really well done. And uh, I look forward to uh, year three for State of Nature Report in Essex. Uh, similarly, Jules, I think you did a, a wonderful job as ever about kind of, I think, really telling us about the stark reality of where we are, but also giving us that perspective and that hope. I mean, I, talking about abundance, I remember I, I used to get 20 plus bullfinches in my garden at one time when I was a small child growing up just outside Chelmsford. Um, but I loved your story about whale watching as well, just how you can show that industries, individuals, communities, um, families can change their approach and can see things through a different lens. So a wonderful story of how um, if you take uh, action, if you be attentive, things can happen. And I think that's what the State of Nature report shows. It's not all doom and gloom. Think If we have the will, we can make things happen. So that's wonderful. I think that's lined us up really nicely. So um, I'm just going to, before we start the AGM, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the voting. Uh, you should have received an email last week uh, with a link to the voting site, which is hosted by our partners, My Voice. You'll need to click on the link, which is included in the email issued by uh, that email, the elections at myvoice.com. If you have any problems with this, you can contact My Voice support team now by emailing the address on the screen. All voting will be via My Voice voting site. For each voting item or items, Jules will read out the title of the vote and a timer will appear on the screen to indicate how long you have left to cast your vote. Follow the instructions on the My Voice voting platform. You will need to select your choice either for, against or abstain and submit your vote. Uh, the result, results will be announced shortly afterwards. We have received um, a number of online and postal votes. These are proxy forms and these will be included in the count. If you've already submitted a proxy vote, then you will not be permitted to vote again. The outcome will then be announced if the motion is uh, carried. The final voting numbers will be published on the website over the next few days. So you can see all of those numbers. If those numbers are, are important to you, they will be, all be verified and you can see those at your leisure. So I'll now pass back to Jules once more and he will chair the business section of the AGM. So Jules, over to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, super. Um, and thank you again to Jeremy for that in introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. So formal AGM begins now. I'd like to welcome you all to the 64th annual general meeting of the Essex Wildlife Trust. Thank you so much for attending. We've received a number of apologies, online votes and proxy forms. Those votes have been checked and counted by our independent scrutineer. And the votes that she has counted and checked have been added to the automatic online poll. And I'll announce each item 
um, uh, uh, whether it's passed um, after the voting period, as, as Andrew just said. Just bear with me for a few seconds as, as, as we do the counting in the background, just to check that the numbers are correct, and then I'll report them back to you all. So item one of the AGM ordinary business component is the consideration of the minutes of the AGM held on the 22nd of October 2022. The minutes were included in the invitation pack and they're also posted on the web page, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is at essexwildlifetrust.org.uk um, slash AGM. I'm sure you've had a look at that. Um, we ask you to vote to accept these minutes. So my voice, um, who are running the show here, um, please would you display the timer, which I think you can see, um, and start the countdown for the first vote. So the the um, phrase is, as a member, I accept the minutes of the AGM held on 22nd of October 2022 as a fair representation of the meeting. Vote for, abstain, or vote against via the My Voice voting platform so we've got the um, timer is now running so we've got 45 seconds Okay, trust that that is all okay. I'm just waiting to hear. Uh, yes, I can confirm that that's been passed. Thank you very much indeed for your voting, everybody. So now we move on to item two on your agenda, which is matters arising. Well, there aren't any. Uh, no matters arising from last year's meeting. As Andrew said, if you've got any specific questions um, that you would like to see raised, then you'll see at the bottom of the Zoom page, there's a Q&A section. Um, if you submit any questions into that Q&A, we'll either deal with them at the end of the meeting or and or um, try to answer them and make sure they're fully answered um, on the website. So Andrew's given a commitment to make sure that we get back to every single question that does come up. So do use that if you feel you'd like to. So um, consideration of item three on the agenda. This is the impact report. So the impact report was included in your, this is where the picture breaks up because of this marvelous um, background. So you can, you can largely see a fragmented picture. Oh no, if I hold it back here, then you can just about see it. A bit failing of technology there. Um, but the wonderful impact report um, uh, was included in your AGM membership pack, um, also available to read online if you want to have a look at that. Um, let me pick on a couple of the of the highlights. Um, it, the impact report focuses on uh, big projects that were achieved during the course of the year, the 40 hectares of improvement at Blue House Farm at the Crouch and 75 hectares of improvement at Fobbing Marsh. Um, both of which included the creation of new wetlands, Fobbing being the place where the Peasants' Revolt began, of course, at Fobbing Church. Um, Bedford's Park Nature Discovery Centre, NDC, was reopened, um, uh, while the Nature Nursery, has, which has recently been rated outstanding by Ofsted, finished its first full year of operations, which is a lovely thing um, to be transferring some of this um, wonder of the nat natural world to um, young people. 100,000 hours were donated by volunteers. As I said earlier, that is um, uh, a uh, wonderful thing. Um, uh, importance of volunteers to nature and to the trust, but also um, to themselves, as volunteers live two years longer than non-volunteers. 11,000 people took part in campaigns and 26,000 people accessed outdoor education. There are 101 species of breeding birds on 
trust nature reserves. And as you've just heard from Jeremy, uh, 19 red listed bird species, 32 amber listed bird species. This is the importance of the reserves, not just important to the place and the people who go there and the nature that's there, but having a much wider uh, regional and system importance. So the overarching theme is um, uh, enormous contribution of members, volunteers and local groups to the trust. So as president, I really would like to extend my thanks again to everybody um, and to commend this document to you as a worthwhile read and a true reflection of, of the wonderful activity undertaken in 2022 and the impact of that on nature and on people's lives. So at this point, we're going to come back to the to the uh, 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 voting for the impact report in a moment, but we wrap that up into um, consideration of the treasurer's report. So I'd like to hand over now to our treasurer, um, Bob Holmes, and he's, there he is up on screen, lovely. Um, and so Bob's going to take us through item four on the agenda, the consideration of the financial statements for the period of 2022. Bob, um, welcome, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jules. As uh, Jules says, my name is Bob Holmes and I'm the Trust's uh, Treasurer. And I'm going to be giving you a brief overview of what happened to the Trust's finances in 2022. Uh, you can find more detailed uh, details uh, on, uh, in the presentation that I've recorded for the Trust website, which you can reach via a link on the AGM page. And I hope that some of you will have had the chance to have a look to, looked at this already. But for anybody who hasn't and wants to find out a bit more about what's going on with the numbers, uh, please do take a look after the AGM is over. Uh, in summary, uh, the Trust incurred a total deficit of £3.2 million in 2022, now, that's partly as a result of the planned operating deficit, which I did mention about uh, last year in my presentation. But it's also because investment markets uh, fell in 2022 after several years of strong growth. But despite that uh, decrease in, in, um, in, in our total funds, the net assets that the trust had at the end of the year remained above £31 million, which is still more than they were at the end of 2019, uh, in the year before the pandemic struck. And at the end of the year, there was more than uh, almost uh, two and a half million pounds in cash reserves in the group's bank accounts. So could I have the first slide, please? Thank you. Uh, and this slide just summarizes the income and expenditure of the trust last year and compares it with 2021. And you can see looking at the top line that the income was down by 200,000 pounds compared to 2021. Uh, and there was a reduction of one and a half million pounds in the total income we received from grants, donations and legacies, which amounted to just about 1.2 million pounds last year. Now, this is a very variable source of income uh, and it does fluctuate quite significantly. It was, in fact, as big as 4.5 million pounds two years ago in 2020. So uh, we have to take a slightly longer term view on, on, on that income and not be concerned about just one year in isolation. Other sources of income either held up as they were in 2021 or increased. And, and, and that includes a 50% increase in sales uh, at our nature discovery centres to a total of £2.4 million. And although that was uh, not quite the level uh, achieved in 2019 before the pandemic struck, nonetheless, the, the centres had a good year. Income received from to fund our charitable activities also grew by half a million pounds as we stepped up activities in this area, as uh, you've seen in the impact report and uh, as you've heard from Jeremy's presentation earlier. Moving down to the next line, the trust expenditure rose by one and a half million pounds to 9.8 million pounds. This includes an additional 400 pounds, uh, 400,000 pounds, excuse me, of expenditure on both our core charitable activities delivering more for wildlife as detailed in the impact report, and also on the cost of running our nature discovery centers where there had been savings during the pandemic. And as sales at our nature discovery centers increased, sales of, uh, through the cafeteria and, and sales at, at, through the shops, so did the direct costs of making those sales, which were up by 700,000 pounds. But I'm pleased to report that uh, the sales company as a whole was profitable once again last year, after two years of losses due to the pandemic. But you can see that as a result of the lower income and the increased costs, 
our operating result changed from a surplus of 300,000 pounds in 2021 to a deficit of 1.4 million pounds last year. And as I mentioned, this deficit was neither unexpected nor unplanned. The trust had been accumulating reserves in recent years, and the trustees have agreed deficit budgets to be funded by excess free reserves to allow the trust to deliver its medium term strategy while income is grown to support the higher cost space on an ongoing basis in due course. This slide also shows the change in the value of the trust's long-term investments and pension liabilities. Investment markets had a difficult year in 2022, thanks to concerns about global inflation, uh, the war in Ukraine, and in the UK, the impact of the mini budget this time last year. And the value of our investment portfolio decreased by 1.8 million pounds as a result. But this year, uh, that uh, decrease has stabilized and there's been a small increase thus far. So overall, 2022 saw some of the gains that we've been making in recent years, in the last two years I've reported on, uh, reverse. Can I move to the next slide? This slide shows what happens to the, cashes, uh, to the trust's cash balances in 2022. But although the income and expenditure statement shows a deficit of 3.2 million pounds, we ended the year with just half a million pounds less cash than at the start of the year. And this short start slide shows why. Some of the items that go through the income and expenditure account are not cash items. The unrealized loss we recurred when the value of our long-term investments decreases is one example, as is the depreciation charge, which writes off amount spent on fixed assets in previous years. But there are also some items that go through the cash, uh, the bank accounts that are not in the income and expenditure account, such as the amounts we've spent on buying new fixed assets and the cash we've drew down from our long-term investments to fund some of those uh, operating deficits. So although we saw a cash outflow of £500,000 in the year, the trust still ended with cash balances of £2.4 million, which is a substantial figure. And we have a reserves policy under which we've decided to and, and agreed to ensure that the amount of cash we hold is never less than one and a half million pounds. Next slide, please. This slide shows the trust balance sheet and it's split according to the types of funds we hold. On the, on the uh, our, our general and designated funds, which are the uh, light, lighter green and the blue bar in the pie chart and the funds to the left-hand side of the uh, chart on the right, together totaled 8.4 million pounds. And these are unrestricted funds, meaning that they can be used for anything that is consistent with achieving the char char charitable objectives. And within that total designated funds, which is the very small numbers, uh, the second set of bars in, are funds which have been earmarked by the trustees for specific projects. By contrast, the Restricted and endowment funds, uh, in the by chart, they are the orange and the dark green funds. They have to be used for the purpose, for, specific, for the specific purpose for which they were given to the trust. And you can see that they account for around about uh, three quarters of the total funds that the trust hold. The big change uh, in, in numbers uh, in 2022 compared to 2021 is a decrease in designated funds. Uh, which now are a very small amount, only £600,000. And that's because the trust has continued to the process it started the previous year of reviewing those funds, which have been designated in previous years, to decide if they are still really necessary for the purposes that were originally set out for. And we've concluded that further funds could be released back to the general funds last year, as well as identifying one particular fund, a two and a half, £2.1 million legacy, which we received in 2020, which does have some restrictions associated with it and has been reclassified, therefore, as a restricted fund. But the effect of this, uh, the reclassification, is that the total of the group's undesignated general funds decreased last year from £9.8 million to £7.8 million, principally as a result of that operating deficit I've spoken about. And that, But the figure is still twice the level of free reserves of three million pounds that the board has set as the minimum it wishes to see held by the trust and its subsidiaries. 
But, uh, and I will make this uh, point again, that as I did last year, we do expect that level of reserves to decline further over the course of the next two to three years as a result of the trust's quite deliberate strategy to run operating deficits and allow its corporate strategy to deliver, to be delivered while it grows its income and returns to a balanced budget in due course. Finally, I'd also like to thank all of those who worked on the 2022 report and accounts. That's our Director of Finance, Sue Howe, and all of the finance team, as well as the auditors at Moore Kingston Smith. And I'm pleased to report that once more, the auditors have issued an unqualified report on the financial statements, which the board approved in August. So it just remains to me to, uh, to propose the resolutions that you see in my final slide. And the first is to take the uh, taking that item three and the first part of item four of the agenda together, the impact report and the audited financial statements for the year ended 31 December 2022 are received. Uh, the second resolution uh, does require a little bit of further comment. More Kingston Smiths have been the trust's auditors for very many years. Uh, at least 17, we discovered. Uh, it is good practice periodically to review the provision of audit services. And so Sue and I decided to, to, to undertake an exercise to do that during the course of this summer. Following this exercise, which uh, where we uh, have received presentations from Moore Kingston Smith and a number of other uh, audit firms, uh, the trustees that have agreed to recommend to the membership that instead of Moore Kingston Smith, Price Bailey LLP be appointed to replace them, Moore Kingston Smith, as auditors for the audit of the 2023 accounts. So the section, second resolution we ask you to vote on is that Price Bailey LLP are appointed as auditors for the year ended 31st of December 2023, and that the, audit, the trustees are authorised to agree the auditor's remuneration. So that concludes my presentation, and I'll now hand back to uh, Jules to take you through the voting on these two resolutions. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Bob. Super. So we've got two votes there. Thank you. That's very cl um, clear and concise. Um, I'd like to ask members then to vote on item three and the first part of item four. So as a member, I received the impact report and the audited financial statements for the year ended 31st of December 2022. Um, if you could vote now, there'll be 45 seconds for you to finish voting. So uh, please proceed. Very good. So I think that that's closed now. So um, I will wait for um, the result. Uh, thank you. That's passed. Uh, thanks very much indeed, everybody. So um, I can confirm the impact report and financial statement for 2022 have been received by members. Um, we can move straight on to item 4A and B, which is the appointment of the auditors. So our treasurer, Bob, as you've just heard, has recommended the appointment of Price Bailey LLP as auditors of the trust for the year ended 31st of December 2023, and that their remuneration is decided by the trustees. So poll three. Um, would be the following. As a member, I agree to appoint Price Bailey LLP as auditors for the trust for the year ended 31st of December 2023 and authorise the trustees to decide the auditor's remuneration. So if you could vote, um, I'd be very appreciative. Thank you.
Okay, that's the voting closed. I see that a member has noted that um, her vote opportunity has disappeared. So perhaps we could make sure that that is recorded. Um, uh, but I can uh, uh, confirm that that um, resolution has been passed. But I think that number should be added on um, if we can make sure that the vote can be recorded for her. Thank you. So that has been confirmed. I confirm that Mr. Price Bailey, LLP, have been appointed as auditors and their remuneration will be decided by the board. Very good. Um, so item five on the agenda. And here we have um, the election of trustees. So there are four trustees standing for reapp reappointment um, at this AGM. Keeley Hazelhurst, Jeff Duffield, Charles Joynson and Catherine Hawkins. Um, the constitution of the trust requires that a proportion of serving members um, stand down um, uh, and we have therefore um, uh, uh, asked Keeley, Jeff, Charles and Catherine to restand to stand for re-election, let me put it that way. Their biographies are available on the website and we hope that you will support the board by accepting their commendation to reappoint these four um, individuals who are also members of the trust and who have uh, important responsibility for ensuring the good governance of the organization. So um, here we have the collage of the trustees. The poll for all four trustees will be shown on the screen now. And there are separate polls for each, um, but they will be shown at the same time. So if you could uh, make your votes so for the reappointment of Keeley, Jeff, Charles and Catherine, in turn, vote for, abstain or vote against um, on the voting platform. That would be much appreciated. So um, 60 seconds this time to do that. Okay, that's the voting closed. So I'm just waiting for the scores. Okay, Keely Hazelhurst passed, Jeff Duffield passed, Charles Joynson passed, Catherine Hawkins passed. Thank you very much everybody. Um, I therefore confirm that these four trustees are duly re-elected to serve as trustees on the board of Essex Wildlife Trust. Thank you. That concludes the ordinary business. We have one item of special business for the AGM. Um, our special business uh, is to vote to reappoint our independent scrutineer for a further 12 months. Uh, Penny Carter, um, has been acting as independent counter and arbitrator for voting. She has checked and verified our proxy voting for the last five years and has agreed to fulfil this role again for us for another year. So um, I would like to recommend um, that as members, uh, you agree to appoint um, or you agree to vote. So this is the um, resolution. As a member, I agree to appoint Penny Carter as scrutineer for the trust for a further 12 months, could you please vote for, abstain, or vote against um, via the My Voice platform?
Okay, so we have a vote that has passed that to agree to appoint Penny Carter as scrutineer for the trust. I note in the chat, um, two or three members are having trouble voting. Um, we will make sure, for example, that your vote is recorded on the list. Um, one person has noted a four, but some people have lost their opportunity to vote. So um, I hope that we are able to look at that. Okay, thank you. That concludes the formal business of the AGM. So we've actually now re reached uh, a point for questions and answers. Um, uh, if you have any questions, then please add them into the Q&A um, uh, session. And we have uh, the first question, which is actually up. How many people are attending this webinar? Um, Kate, it's about 80. I'll give you the full number when it's reported back to me. Um, so, um, Andrew, uh, we uh, have a couple of questions um, uh, at the top of the list here and a number of others that have been um, passed to us. Uh, we will prioritise any that come up in the in the Q&A, but this is an opportunity for us to put to use some issues that have come up from uh, members and others. Um, so are you ready to go for a few minutes on this, Andrew? Definitely, let's go. Lovely. OK, great. So there's a question from Dean Muslin. I live in Rochford, Essex, which has many open spaces and country land, some of which has recently been hugely developed by a housing company, Bloor Homes, to build um, 600 homes, new homes. Uh, do you as a wildlife char charity see future in my area of Essex, Rochford, um, presumably, uh, for rewilding, wild planting, um, green areas and spaces to roam? So uh, a broad question, but specifically about Rochford as well. So thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dean. Yeah, I can understand, you know, when you live somewhere and you see see houses cropping up all over the place, it can be a, maybe a little bit depressing sometimes you see a lack of green space. But we've got a, a wilder communities programme. And what this is aiming to do is to support communities to rewild areas of towns or villages and urban spaces where they live. Now, what we're looking for as a trust is those urban champions. And we have a, a great many number of urban champions at the minute. And this will lead to creating these green resources for communities. Now, as I'm sure you understand, the, the trust isn't uh, big enough to do everything itself. But what we aim to do through the Wilder Communities Programme, through the green, um, through the Urban Champions, is to inspire people, empower people, train people, support people with the knowledge and the skills to drive things forward. So as much as we might not have a specific project at the minute in Rochford, we have plans for places like Rochford for communities. So there's definitely a future to rewild areas in Rochford. But what we're looking to do is to have communities and individuals actually want to do it and to take it forward themselves and drive it forward and really empower those people to do those. So if you want more information on that, please do get in touch with us uh, and we can try and support you and your community to do that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Andrew. So a question from Dr. Mary Younger. Um, I recently heard that the Royal Society of Wildlife Trusts <coughs> has decided to discontinue the bird food partnership with Vine House Farm. So are Essex Wildlife Trust going to continue to work with Vine House? Uh, what is the rationale for ending what appears to have been a mutually beneficial arrangement? She says, um, I was very disappointed to learn of this decision and want to understand why this has been made. So I wonder if you can address that, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um... Again, completely understand Vinehouse Farm is quite a strong brand. People know what they stand for in terms of sustainable farming and wanting to give back to for wildlife. Uh, they had a national deal with the Wildlife Trust and we have 46 Wildlife Trusts. And, and when you try and uh, corral those 46 around one thing, that's not always uh, simple because it doesn't necessarily, it might seem straightforward, but it doesn't always work. It's not always the perfect deal for everyone. And with Vinehouse, not everyone was happy with the deal that was on the table. From an Essex Wildlife Trust perspective, um, Vinehouse wanted uh, exclusivity um, in terms of sort of presence and advertising on our website. And we didn't think that that was something that we could give up for what was a relatively small uh, return on that um, asset of, of advertising, a, a very small amount of money. Don't forget, also at the time, we were producing our own bird seed at Abbott's Hall Farm. So we were producing the bird seed and packaging it up ourselves. So we were largely fulfilling our, our seed orders ourselves. Then when we moved away from farming at Abbott's Hall, 
we started to build up a financial relationship with Gardman Birdseed. And from our perspective, that was a much better financial offer from what Vinehouse Farm were offering. So despite the fact that we support Vinehouse Farm and, and everything they stand for, as I hope you would expect, that we make sure that um, we are doing the best for wildlife and therefore we're doing the best to get the best commercial deal for what we're offering. And we got that with Gardman and not with Vinehouse Farm. That's not to say that we won't return to Vinehouse, but we have to play one up against the other to make sure we're doing what's right for the trust and what's right for our finances. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so uh, to answer Kate Collins in your in the Q&A, how many people are attending? We're on 50 attendees um, plus um, participants from the um, the the trust and, and myself added into the on top of that number at the meeting. Um, I have a, we have a question from Josie Close. So um, in the q and I'll just read it out, um, Andrew. Um, my concern is about the potential building of mini new pylons to bring on shore um, the offshore generated power. Is it possible for Essex Wildlife Trust to reach out to agencies not usually considered partners in providing in protecting wildlife and the environment to work for less impactful solutions? A pretty big topic for a lot of people across um, across the region, both in Essex and indeed in Suffolk. Indeed. Um, and, and pylons is a very emotive subject, particularly in East Anglia at the minute. And yes, of course, we want to work with all partners to make sure that we can get the best deal for wildlife at the end of the day. It's not a case of we see one particular sector or industry or company as someone that we wouldn't talk to. We want to talk to everyone. We're talking to people about nuclear power. We don't necessarily, we're not in favor of it because it would uh, destroy uh, an incredible estuary in the Blackwater, which has a marine conservation zone, but that does not preclude us from talking to nuclear power about what they're doing. Similarly, with the pylons, we want to talk to all of those energy providers to see if we can make sure if there were other solutions, if there are other, if there's potential, if we have to do something, if we can make sure that we're doing it in the most sustainable way and taking wildlife into consideration. So we will talk to everyone. No one is off the table. And let's we're only, we're only going to find these solutions if we work together. We all need electricity to put our kettles on to have webinars like this. But that doesn't mean to say that there aren't better solutions out there. And we want to be at the heart of those discussions, hopefully steering people in a, a more sustainable and more green way of thinking. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Mary Younger, who's just come back to say thank you for your comment on the previous um, item on bird food partnerships. Um, thanks for that. I mean, it's worth noting that in the northeast of England, um, the cable was actually put under the sea um, uh, to a, a similar kind of um, uh, transfer that is being uh, required for pylons in this part of the country. So I think we've still got a bit of a road to travel um, on this and we may we may see changes in due course. Um, Andrew Beavers, um, any plans, does the trust have any plans for introducing more beavers into Essex? Um, we have uh, them in one location in Finchingfield, um, uh, but that's not a trust operation, but obviously it's something we, many of us will know a lot about and indeed have visited. Um, but say, could you say a little bit about beavers? Indeed, yes. Yeah. So you're, you're right, they are at Finching Field. Uh, they were released in 2019 uh, at Spain's Hall. And it's really Archie Ruggles Bryce that's driving this, a very innovative landowner. Essex Wildlife Trust was supporting this. We were advising uh, from an ecological perspective and very supportive of what Archie was doing. They now have 12 beavers in total in an area of about 44 hectares. So it's, it's and they're doing fantastic things from an ecological perspective. And many other wildlife trusts across the UK have released beavers. Um, their ability to dam rivers and hold back water in the landscape is a is a great way of natural flood management. There are currently no plans for Essex Wildlife Trust to release beavers anytime soon, but that's not to say that we won't in the future if the right project comes along. But we have to make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons in the right location rather than just get carried away and see it as a bit of a vanity project. And it's something that creates headlines. We need to make sure that it's the right site. Um, but yes, they're fantastic animals that have, uh, you know, a great nature based solutions. We need we've seen so many things in the media about flooding, obviously, all over the world. We need to hold back these floodwaters and natural flood management is a wonderful tool to do that. So maybe we will watch this space. And Finching Field hasn't had any flooding from that particular part of the of the watershed since the beavers have been doing their extraordinary work. I mean, there were 32 dams within the first year and a half weren't there from the small yeah. number so it is a it is a wonderful thing isn't it um uh 
a specific question on on vehicles. So, uh, uh, question: Why is the trust still using diesel vehicles? Uh, surely it should be using electric vehicles or at least thinking about the transition towards electrifying um, its transport fleet. So there's, could you talk a little bit about that? Obviously, um, uh, a challenge at any particular time to make those changes, but something that is being signalled um, as an important part of the climate, um, addressing yeah. climate. And, and, and obviously we want to be kind of walking the talk a, 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 as well. We want to be sh demonstrating that we are doing those things. We don't just want to tell other people to do it. We want to show that we're willing to do it ourselves. So having an electric fleet is indeed our overall vision. However, at the minute, not all of our vehicles that we use on a day-to-day -day basis have an equivalent electric vehicle. For example, our four-wheel drive vehicles. There is no comparison at the minute in an electric vehicle that um, can pull or carry or deliver the things that we need. That's just the simple fact at the minute. Just as one example, I've been to Toyota's head office, their main factory, and they have told me that as a company directly coming from head office, they have made the corporate decision to wait for the electric infrastructure to be in place in the UK before they roll out a full range of electric vehicles. Now, clearly with the government's recent announcement on delaying the ban on diesel and petrol vehicles from 2030 to 2035, that isn't going to help that scenario. So there's a lot of uncertainty at the minute, both in terms of car buyers, but also manufacturers. However, the trust has already invested in some electric vehicles to test whether these uh, vehicles and the existing electric charging infrastructure will allow us to be able to carry out our work around the county. So we're not going to get um, a whole load of new electric vehicles, but when we need a new vehicle and we don't have that electric one, we're not purchasing petrol or diesel vehicles. We're now hiring and leasing vehicles so that we're not actually having that uh, ownership of vehicles. And then a bit, little bit further down the road, we're left with these vehicles that we don't actually want. So as a solution, in the short term, hiring and leasing. So we are transitioning to electric, but it won't just be overnight. We're transitioning as quickly as possible uh, and testing electric vehicles so we can see how we can get on. So it's happening. It's maybe not happening as quickly as we would like for various reasons that are outside of our control. Lovely. Thank you. Um, we're likely to see the first electric planes carrying up to 30 people by about 2030. So there's enormous innovation happening in this sector. I'm not suggesting we should have a, an electric plane that get us get people around quickly. Um, but but we're seeing the innovation in, in the sector coming along. So that's that's a welcome sign. Abbott's Hall. Um, could you say something about Abbott's Hall and um, uh, the policy about opening up to the public? It's closed to the public at the moment, Andrew. So uh, Yeah, it's been closed since March 2020 when COVID first uh, happened and it's uh, it's been closed ever since. And during the last three years, the, the reserve really hasn't been a, a priority in terms of visitor access. And some of the infrastructure has deteriorated a little bit. The, the hides have taken a bit of a battering from, from the elements. In some cases, birds and wasps have taken over in those hides and we need to deal with that. Some of the paths have got overgrown. Uh, there's a few trip hazards. So we need to make sure that we're going to look at that from a health and safety point of view. Plus, over the last three years on site, we didn't have as big a staff presence. So there was still the potential risk for uh, visitors that you know may wander off and, and engage with farm machinery, which is still accessible in the yard. So there's lots of health and safety considerations that we have to fix before we can reopen. In addition, we now have to consider the fact that we've got a nature nursery on site. Jules has already mentioned that the two to five year olds are uh, uh, in, according to Ofsted, beyond outstanding it was, uh, and a magical place. But what, there's obviously safeguarding considerations that we have to take into account now that we've got children on site. England's coastal path will be coming through the farm in 2025, so obviously we've got to make plans for that. So I would imagine that we will reopen Abbots Hall Reserve uh, at some point next year. It won't be between now and the end of the year, but at some point next year, I don't want to put a month on it because I couldn't tell you that, and then I'm going to let people down. But at some point next year, it will reopen, but we need to make sure that we are reopening uh, in a safe way so that all of our visitors and all of the children on site are, are protected. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, a specific question from Josie coming back on the um, uh, undersea cables, what was required to achieve this solution? Um, well, it was government giving a steer to um, Power Networks UKPN um, to put them under the sea. So we do have a technical and a political solution. It's just not happening at the moment um, uh, in this region. But that's the reason why I said there's the potential for things to change 
if enough people um, uh, are expressing their views, uh, which I think we probably can all see the sorts of things that we might want. Um, dogs, dogs and nature discovery centres, Andrew. Um, uh, why don't we let dogs into the nature discovery centres? So I think this is about the actual NDCs themselves as opposed to the reserves, but could you just kind of explain the, the dog policy? Yes, indeed. Um, it, it's a question that does come up a lot, allowing dogs into centres. It's a constant topic of conversation. And we did trial it in a, a number of centres recently, but we did find it was untenable from the point of view of health and safety for our visitors. Now, I am a dog owner. I love my dogs, so I can completely sympathise. I obviously believe that my dogs are well trained, they're well behaved and they wouldn't hurt a fly, as probably most dog owners do. Uh, however, we have to think about the health and safety implications of having those dogs in the centres. For every 10 people who get in touch with us saying that, why don't you have dogs in your centres? We probably receive five times as many people saying we should keep dogs out of centres. So I think we just have to accept that we're never going to keep everyone happy. And therefore, we have to, I guess, revert to the health and safety protocols, which makes a, a, a clear decision on this uh, on this matter. What we are doing is that we try and have serving hatches where we can. We have places where you can tie up your dogs. We have seated areas outside which are under cover. It's not perfect, but we're trying as much as we can to uh, embrace dog owners because dog owners at the end of the day, they walk their dogs at least once a day, sometimes twice a day. And therefore they are out there interacting with nature. They are nature lovers, outdoor lovers. So we don't want to exclude those people. But we do have to think about the health and safety implications of having animals inside. And it's not for everyone, uh, but that's the position that we take. Thank you. Could we could we go up to a really big one? Um, so from from dogs and NDCs, biggest challenges facing the trust. I mean, I think we've kind of heard some of those already from the introductory pieces, including Jeremy's piece on the state of nature. Um, I mean, we could say it's the climate crisis, it's the nature crisis, but in terms of the specific challenges facing the trust at the moment. What would you be? What would you be pointing towards for members to keep a, a kind of watch on? Really, I think there's probably two things: one internal, one external. Internally, Bob has already touched on this in his presentation. Our financial sustainability is a big challenge. Deficit budget, cost of living. We've got more competition and funds than ever before. So we have to make sure that we're operating within our means. So although we're an ambitious organisation and we are delivering great things and sometimes we have to say no to things and people say, why aren't you doing this? But it's a case of we have to make sure that we're operating within our means. So internally, really keeping a, 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 a strong hand on the tiller, for want of a better phrase, in terms of those finances is absolutely paramount. Externally, you said it yourself, it's, it, uh, Jules, it's hard to look beyond the climate change because that drives uh, everything. But I think if we're looking at specifics, I think we have to look at... Uh, the lack of political will at the minute. And I hope you realise, and I've said this before, and we'll make it clear, we're not a political organisation. We're non-partisan. We don't side with any political uh, party. But it's incumbent upon me as chief executive and us as a, as, a, uh, as a charity, an environmental charity, to comment on that. Because, I mean, I think you've seen, for, let's pick an example, the Rosebank oil field. We're talking about energy now. That decision is not based in the interests of climate. It's really politically motivated. If you look in the last few months, Germany has committed to cut its energy consumption by 26% by 2030. And they've passed legislation to make it compulsory. So there are solutions out there in Europe. We don't just need more oil. So we've seen lots of uh, examples over the last few months where the government appears to be rowing back on things. And it's not just the government. Some of the main parties that are in opposition are equally not you know, rushing forward. So political will is a massive issue that we have to kind of really push and not be afraid to get involved in conversations which might be a little bit uncomfortable but for the sake of the environment we have to put it at the front of our agenda and have those discussions and because we're part of a federation 46 other wildlife trusts we can have that political voice so Craig Bennett chief executive of the wildlife trust was talking to the secretary of state for the environment the other day was talking to the chancellor and we have to be bold enough to kind of say, look, this isn't good enough. This isn't good enough for our children or our children's children. We need to be making the decisions that aren't what's best in 18 months time or three years time. What's best in 10, 15, 20 years time or in perpetuity. So politics is is not everyone's cup of tea, but we can't avoid it. And it clearly has a big imp impact upon uh, the, the the workings of the trust and on the, the agenda um, for 
protecting and um, improving nature in the region. So thank you for that. Um, uh, final final thought. We had twenty minutes for for this section. So um, uh, uh, as you've mentioned, there there are there are many challenges and problems they're facing at the moment. Um, good reasons to be optimistic. Someone says, should I remain optimistic in the face of all of this? Well. I think with 64 years of success under the belt as a trust and 40,000 members and the, the wonderful impact report we've seen, I think I would say um, yes, in some ways. Um, but but what what? let me give the final word to you about, about kind of optimism and hope, really. I, I definitely think there's, there's much optimism uh, to be had and much hope. Yes, I completely understand the frustrations. And yes, we have good days and bad days. And some days when it's bad, you think, oh, my God, I'm banging my head against a brick wall. But there's so much out there. And the State of Nature report showed these things that are out there. I mean, look at the Wildlife Trust. Look at Essex Wildlife Trust. You know, we've converted Northwest Europe's biggest landfill site to an incredible nature park, which will be developed over the next uh, five years. Who would have thought that you could turn a hole in the ground full of rubbish into an incredible asset where people can have uh, long walks, they can go cycling, they can see nature, where you can have rare species uh, breeding, thriving. Uh, there's incredible things. We've talked about our nature nursery, where we're seeing the value. Two to five-year-olds are loving being outside. The parents are loving their children's attitude to life being outside because they're changing in front of their eyes. They're learning about things. They're learning bird calls. We've got two to five-year-olds that are learning blue tits, great tits, robins. They can identify them from calls now. So if you want any inspiration, go to the nature nursery and see the beaming faces on these little kids. And, and I think it's, for me, it's very inspiring. So there are so many projects across Essex Wildlife Trust where we're doing great things and we're proving that things can actually happen. If the will is there, if the resources are there, we have the skills, we have the knowledge, and we're prepared to share those and make great things happen. So it's amazing, but we can't do it without your support. So thank you so much for everything you do to allow us to be able to deliver these things. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. Well, that's uh, that's 20 minutes for the questions and answers, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed for that. Members, thank you very much for your questions and your engagement with that. That that um, concludes the last part of the AGM, um, but not the last part of the meeting. So I'll hand back to you, Andrew, because you're going to steer us through the Wilder Essex uh, Awards, which will be the final part of this meeting. Um, so, Andrew, thank you very much. And um, over to you. Thank you, Jules. And thank you again, once again, this year for taking us through the AGM with such uh, great panache as ever and great insight. Uh, very inspiring to have you uh, at the helm of the organisation, as always. So thank you for that, giving up your uh, Saturday morning to take us through that. Now, the awards. Yes, this is one of the uh, favourite parts of the AGM, the Wilder Essex Awards. These awards go to individuals uh, and groups who have been helping to bring the vision of a Wilder Essex to life. The winners and nominees really are some of the county's heroes, I think. They're, they are wildlife heroes for everything that they do. I'd love to give awards to hundreds of people, thousands of people across the Trust, but we can't do that. The first of this year's awards is the Wilder Communities Award, and this goes to an individual or a community who has shown real commitment to wildlife and the environment in the local area. And I'm delighted to announce that Black Notley Parish Council are the recipients of this award in 2023. Black Notley Parish Council joined Wilder Towns, Wilder Villages programme in July of 2022. And since then, they've taken real impactful action for wildlife across their open spaces. So that's really, really exciting. And I think if we're going to ask people to take action, if we're going to maybe even demand people take action, then we have to make sure that when people do take action, we praise them and we highlight the things that they're doing. So it's a massive congratulations to Black Notley Parish Council. Uh, next award is the Green Leader Award for an individual who is inspiring others and leading the way in terms of conservation and climate. And again, it gives me huge pleasure to announce that the award goes to Andrew Millen. Now, Andrew is a true wildlife hero, an ambassador for the Trust, and is the perfect example, I think, of someone who advocates for nature right across the Trust in everything that he does. This includes uh, writing nature blogs for us. He has been completing forest school training. Uh, he's even written his own nature book. He's even singing about nature. He's a very inspiring young man, uh, and we're delighted that he's one of our ambassadors. So it's a man many congratulations to Andrew for being the green leader for this year. 
Next award is a green leader under 16. And I think this is really important, although I loved what Jill said about the fact that it's it's not for young people to be the solution. We can't always say, oh, it's, it's the next generation that's going to save us. They shouldn't have that pressure to save us. But to be engaged and be attentive, as Jules was saying, is wonderful. So uh, the young person uh, showing exemplary commitment to wildlife and the environment this year is Harriet Moore. Now, Harriet's amazing, uh, amazing young lady. She's our first ever junior ambassador. She was involved with the trust making content for social media, particularly during COVID when we're all in lockdown and we have wildlife TV. She's doing incredible things, making videos uh, for our campaigns. A lot of her videos were incredibly popular. She reached a real high number on social media, particular her one about uh, making a hedgehog house. Do go and look for Harriet Moore making a hedgehog house. It's wonderful. So uh, yeah, a very inspiring young lady and it's huge congratulations to Harriet for being the green leader uh, under 16 award winner for this year. So well done, Harriet, fantastic. Next is our Wilder Business Award, which is awarded to a corporate partner or a local business that shows an exemplary commitment to supporting wildlife. And there, as I said, there are so many across the county. And, and I love the fact that we have a difficult job trying to find out who is going to be the winner because there are so many. I always talk to people about it's like like the Oscars. You can only get one best picture every year, but that's not to say that there aren't a year full of hundreds of amazing films. And it's the same with our corporate partners who we couldn't deliver the work we do without. But this year's winner is George Thompson Limited. Now, George Thompson Limited operates a farming enterprise that has expanded its operations into natural capital development. The farm has a history of innovation dating back to the 1970s. And today, George Thompson Limited has shifted its focus entirely towards nature based farming, as well as offering contracting services for woodland creation and planting hedgerows. Now, you know, with 75 percent of Essex, at least in some kind of um, arable form, it's vital if we want 30 percent of Essex protected and connected for nature um, and actively managed for nature by 2030, which is one of our targets. We want to be talking to landowners. We want to be talking to farmers. We want to be learning from these individuals who are doing incredible things. So we can learn a lot from what George Thompson is doing. And we're delighted to support what they're doing and highlight what they're doing in terms of nature based farming. So many congratulations to George Thompson Limited. Uh, the final award is the Ray Marsh Award. And this is presented every year to an outstanding volunteer. You will remember that this came about uh, about four years ago now when uh, I wanted to uh, celebrate what Ray Marsh had achieved with six decades of work on Skipper's Island. And we've done that every year ever since uh, to commemorate uh, Ray's achievements as a volunteer. So every year we commemorate a volunteer and it gives me huge pleasure of our 2000 volunteers. Uh, many of you will be on the screen now. And again, you know, we just couldn't do what we do without those volunteers. I was at a volunteer thank you event down in Benfleet, one in Danbury as well in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and it's lovely to speak to volunteers to hear how passionate they are, how incredibly committed they are, all of the knowledge that they have. So much of what we do, we just couldn't do. It's a, the best part of 100,000 hours last year of volunteer time. That's equivalent to over 50 staff members. It's phenomenal, really humbling and inspiring to see these volunteers. And it gives me great pleasure to say that the recipient of the Ray Marsh Award this year is Kathleen Hunter. Now, Kathy has been working on Two Tree Island for several decades, visiting the site on a weekly basis, going to regular work parties, weekly work parties, monthly work parties, taking part in many additional actions such as butterfly transects, bird surveys, litter picks, walkovers, reptile surveys, and many, many more. And I think it's her passion and her care for the site, a site that she truly loves, one of the trust most or oldest sites uh, down at Two Tree Island. It's a difficult site. There's a lot of challenges there, a lot of people challenges, dog walking challenges. Um, it's a well-used site, but it's an incredible site for wildlife and Kathy has uh, together with her, uh, her husband Harry have been wonderful in supporting staff and volunteers sharing her knowledge sharing all of the information sharing documentation and really demonstrating best practice and how to be an amazing um, ambassador for the trust a real advocate through the work that she does quite incredible um, just demonstrating how to use equipment. There's a bit of a, a joke about how she loves to sit, uh, uh, drive around on the sit-on mower. So if you ever see anyone on Two Tree Island on a sit-on mower, it's probably Kathy doing the part. So uh, we want to thank Kathy for her amazing commitment to the Trust, a very well-deserved award. Uh, thank you to her. Congratulations on this year's recipient of the Ray Marsh Award. 
So well done to all of those award winners. As I said, it's really important for, for me and for the trust, for the staff, for the board to be able to celebrate these individuals. We cannot do what we do without all of these individuals. Yes, 200 staff. Uh, it's a medium-sized charity. You know, we do big things and we're achieving great things. But Essex is a big place. So if we want to have that scale, if we want to have that impact, if we want to really deliver things, we need support. We need advocates. We need people that are going to be ambassadors. We need people doing it for us. So that's where these award winners and so many other people are helping us. So thank you to that. That's us done, really. Uh, I'd just like to say a final thank you, really, uh, once again to uh, Jules Pretty for taking us through uh, the business and for his inspiring talk at the beginning, to My Voice for hosting the event today, to Bob for running us through the finances so beautifully and clearly, for uh, Jeremy for taking us through the um, incredible stories of how wildlife is doing on our sites. That's uh, very inspiring as well. Must have a shout out to three individuals, uh, Deb Hart, Sue Howe and Karen Kendon, who I know this is online and you think, oh, online, that's easy. You just turn your computer on, Andrew. Not quite as simple as that. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. And those three individuals have done a huge amount to help that actually be delivered. So thank you very much for uh, that. But mostly I would like to thank you on the call today, your members. But you may also be trustees. You may be members of the local group representatives. You may be volunteers. You may be supporters, corporate members, partners, legators. You may be funders. Whatever your link to the trust, as I said, we can't do it without you. And I cannot overstate that enough. We need that support so that we can carry on with the amazing work that we do as a charity. And I hope you feel part of something. You feel proud of what we're doing and you feel excited. Although there's big challenges, you feel excited about what's happening going forward. That's the end of our AGM. So thank you for taking part. Um, if this was an in-person event, I would obviously wish you a safe journey home. You're already within your home. So instead, I'll wish you a lovely weekend. And I will leave you with another short video, which shows for me, not just the wonderful wildlife that we have, but it shows the vital work that the trust does and it shows the trust at our best. So I very much look forward to seeing you, hopefully face to face, all being well. I see no reason why we shouldn't stop it. I don't want to jinx it, but we're very committed to having a face to face event next year in the summer. I look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, have a lovely weekend. Thank you for your support and thank you for joining us today. Bye. Thank you.